For Ken Arthurson and John Quayle, the opening of the 1995 season was to be the beginning of an era and the culmination of 12 years of hard work to drag rugby league into the present. With the competition including four new clubs and for the first time running under the banner of the Australian Rugby League, the season was launched with a series of gala events punctuated by a three-day opening round roadshow taking games at Auckland, Brisbane, Townsville and Perth. Before the weekend was over, however, Super League had re-emerged, its shadow dimming the light of the ARL's triumph. A new era had indeed begun, just not the one Arthurson and Quayle had imagined. This is Nevermore Ritzy, the sixth chapter in the Rugby League Digest in-depth investigation of the Super League. Yeah. Welcome back to the Rugby League Digest. I'm Michael Adams here with Andrew Paskin. How are you, Andy? Mate, super. This this is it. This is basically Super League Eve, this episode. Wow. So uh, a, a lot to, to get through before that. So this is where we're starting, the, the opening of the 1995 season. And we've spoken about it before, the air of excitement we were feeling and the idea that something had changed in Rugby League. The four new teams were so exciting. I was just over the moon for it. We had, we had no idea as teenagers that the turmoil behind closed yeah. doors. <laughs> And personally, as, as someone who, you know, was very concerned about Super League any time I heard about it, and you had this stop-start thing where it came up in November, then it got crushed, it came up again in February, and that was like the real thing, and then it got crushed again. Well, I thought we had five years of leeway after, <laughs> like, after the loyalty agreement. So yeah. I thought that was it. Was yeah. Like, okay, well. And that's not just our underdeveloped brains. That's the way it was being reported. Yeah. It was, you know, game over. You know, I, I still remember like newspaper front pages, news reports, and just the sense of relief I felt. So think about being John Quayle and, you know, the amplification of that relief as you thought that now you could just get on with running football. And there was a real sense of excitement. You can see that in John Quayle's quotes that he really believed that it was the beginning of something. So I'll just read this quote from the Rugby League Week. After all the talk and all the months of speculation, I'm delighted we're off and running. I think the new clubs did us proud. This was talking about the to his Challenge Cup. There's an immense amount of work in creating a new club from nothing. And as much as anyone, I'm aware of the vast effort that's gone into all four of them. For each of them to come out and be instantly competitive was a tribute to all the effort that's gone in and to the quality of their recruitment program. So much is dependent on competitiveness Yeah, from the outset. Uh, so all the promotion was geared around these four new clubs. And so on top of the excitement of the four new clubs, you had the continued efforts to promote the game in regional areas with the Challenge Cup for the second year running taking place in the bush. But in typical rugby league style, it was an opportunity to promote the game that resulted in the game shooting itself in the foot. <laughs> so, and this became all the more serious when it was a logistical failure at a time when you were expecting clubs to be traveling around the country and to another country on, on a regular basis yeah so on one of the weekends of the challenge cup the western reds and cronulla were playing in inverell and the arl decided to not put them up for the night but have them fly back uh, after the game there was an issue with the flight it got rerouted to newcastle they had to take a bus from newcastle back to sydney in the end it was a five-hour trip that meant the reds players had an hour to sleep before they had to be back on a plane to perth it, it led to people saying well why why were they leaving straight after full time in the first place you know that that's not really promoting the game if you're just playing and leaving. Yeah, yeah. You know, do some work. Is it ARL penny pinching? How much could a motel in Inverell cost you? Yeah, exactly. Um, at another game, something went wrong in Bega and uh, five Penrith officials, including coach Roy Simmons, had to share a room together. <laughs> I think Royce ended up like uh, talking to a journalist and, and betting down with him. But all these logistical errors w were going on and, you know. That's just unacceptable to have five players in a room unless there's a woman there. <laughs> And the, the Sherlock quote in the Rugby League Week uh, pretty neatly sums up the tenor of, of the, the Challenge Cup and how it was being talked about. Whoever was to blame, sponsors, the league, Rupert Murdoch or the Man of the Moon, last Friday night's kerfuffle which had million dollar football teams flying around at midnight in Tiger Moths looking for a paddock to land in was unforgivable. <laughs> Tiger 
Mouse. It's Mickey Mouse o- occasions like that that crash tackle the league's credibility as it stutters on towards expansion and eventually true professionalism. The fact is, the one thing the league has got to get right in this geographically challenged 20 team year is the question of seamless travel and accommodation arrangements. If they don't, the Premiership will lapse into something of a shambles. I'm picturing like Roy Simmons in like one of, one of those leather red Baron hats <laughs> with the goggles. <laughs> This is how how little faith I have in rugby league administration. When I first read that, I actually took it seriously. I was like, <laughs> they were flying in Tiger Moss. <laughs> Great writing. <man. laughs> uh, so not the, the first hit out you wanted and dampening the buzz slightly. So they had to get it right with their gala opening night, which was, was held at the Sydney Entertainment Center, a, you know, glitzy black tie affair. In all the writing about the event I read, there was one one thing I wanted to talk to you about this uh, to my mind he might have been doing it for a decade already but an early example of buzz rothfield shit stirring <laughs> he said much to the embarrassment of rothman's executives the australian rugby league has booked a smoke-free zone for an extravaganza to launch this year's winfield cup the company's corporate affairs director peter alexander admits he's disappointed it's a shame it's not being held at a venue where people can smoke the people at the entertainment center should realize that 26 percent of the australian of the australian population smoke we believe people should have the right to choose that's just sickening <laughs> why would you like love that grenade at the ARL? Like, <laughs> the game we love is just constantly affiliated with animals, <laughs> gambling, bloody cigarettes, booze, like just, oh God. And then you've got Jonos taking up their cause for them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, you know, a bit, bit of a bad taste there, but the night was going to be a massive success. You had, you know, the who's who of Australian society. You had prime ministers, opposition leaders. You had, you know, the, the top businessmen. One, one thing you didn't have was players. <laughs> So all, all the ex-players were there, but it was decided that current players were surplus to requirements. Well, you know what? I actually think as long as they've got the ex-players there, that's going to stop disgruntled yeah. media yeah. outbursts. Mm. Yeah, very good point. If they, if they neglected ex-players, look out. Yeah. And one of the ex-players who was there and was in fact the kind of the fulcrum to the whole event was Mal Meninga, who was there to launch the season as the ARL's figurehead. Interestingly, it was at this event where seeds were sown for the later event in April where Mal Meninga came out at Cronulla Leagues Club and said he got nothing from the game. So the the ARL since he retired and probably a bit before had spoken about Mal's future in the game you know after he finished playing and promising him a role at the same time News Limited had offered him a job with Anset and were promising you know management training and you know all these opportunities to actually set him up for life. Anset dodged the bullet by going broke. <laughs> So at the season launch, Mal Meninga went up to John Quayle and said, you know, what do you got basically? I'm keen to work. I'm keen to do something. And basically got a non-committal response from Quayle who didn't really offer anything concrete. And at that point, Mal started, you know, questioning whether he would be looked after. Meanwhile, he's got this great offer from a company that with, you know, actual clout behind them. It seems insane that they just didn't throw him a bone. Yeah. Like he would have been a major piece for them. Mm, yeah. And it's just that thing where just this, this slight or this perceived slight just suddenly like spins everything off the rails would you class this as a sliding doors moment <laughs> in rugby league <laughs> so it wasn't just mal it was a you know big event featuring lee kernigan who'd written the the cowboys club song and said that if they were offering him a thousand to one on the cowboys he'd put a thousand dollars on them <laughs> to, to win the whole thing uh and and of course the the star of the show uh yanni who in, in our <laughs> Ken Arthurson, History Corner, we talked about uh, ushering in a new age, which gives us the title of this episode, where Ken Arthurson said that Yanni's appearance showed that rugby league had never been more ritzy. <laughs> They're one of the great quotes. Uh, I, I think this is not as succinct, but it actually might trumpet for uh, delusion. So this was David Page writing in the Rugby League Week about Yanni's uh, upcoming performance. Yanni may not be quite as hip as Tina Turner, but he's likely to prove as popular with rugby league fans. More importantly, he's certain to sell the sport to an even broader audience. With his revolutionary New Age symphonies, Yanni stole the show at the Black Tie Gala Dinner at the Sydney Entertainment Centre last Monday. Along with his 50-piece orchestra, the world-acclaimed composer was special guest of the, the Australian Rugby League. Yanni's performance was a, was a feature of the gala event, which will be televised in a one-hour special on Thursday night. 
Imagine if like Cole Chisel played at the Tiddlywinks World Championships annual event. Like, do you reckon we'd all be following that immediately? Like- <laughs> and I think from that quote, and by the fact that this was an event aimed at like you know society's elite, it was a an actual attempt from Australian Rugby League to show that they were like more than a buff head kind of you know meat pie. <laughs> I'll give them that because it, they're always in a hiding to nothing. Apart from Tina Turner, whatever they hire is never good yeah. enough. So we have to give them that. At least they tried. <laughs> Leading to one of the all time classic damned if you do damned if you don't uh this this was sherlock criticizing the the league for getting yarny i'm going to propose something absolutely radical here and suggest that rugby league goes aussie in its promotional activities next year let's go oz as we head on towards 2000 wheeling kylie i say it's it's always (laughs) it it has to be an australian act and then if you do that for a couple of years in a row it's like rugby league just can't draw the big international (laughs) fairness to sherlock who do gurus was the second most popular campaign what did you think of that campaign campaign oh, at the time i liked it a lot yeah I, I thought it was it went on for a few too many seasons i think make milk as much as you can <laughs> it's simply the best uh in in the school of spinal tap the the sydney morning herald gave a, a one word review to yanni's performance uh calling it yawny <laughs> but yanni's appearance did pave the way for one of the great photos of rugby league history which appeared in the rugby league week of yanni flanked by luke rickardson and terry hill <laughs> i would love to speak to Yanni <laughs> about his opinions of Terry Hill. <laughs> that, that's got to be up there with the Gavin Miller, Cliffy and, yeah. and Tina combo. But so when I was uh, looking into this, I, I think in our Arco History Corner, I said, you know, Yanni was never cool, but 1995, not knowing that 1995 was the absolute height of Yanni's uh, commercial appeal. And that was all because of a special he recorded, Yanni Live at the Acropolis, about 12 months earlier, which went on to become a global sensation, was at the time the second highest music video of all time behind Michael Jackson's Thriller. Well, let me ask you this then. We're on the subject. If they hired Andre Rial, whatever his name is, Ryu, uh, a couple of years ago when he was massive with yeah. Baby Boomers, would you be happy with that as a promo for the game? No, I personally wouldn't, but I could I could see the sense in doing that. Yeah, well, it's kind of like that, isn't it? It, it is kind of like that. But Yanni, the balls of this guy. So he wasn't he wasn't a complete unknown, but he basically funded this concert. He, you know, paid for people to attend. Um, you know, put on this huge spectacle at his own cost, with the idea that that could elevate him you know to a new level of success and you got to keep in mind he was a, a new age composer you know like he, he'd won grammys but the grammy for best new age recording might as well be the grammy for best rugby league history podcast <laughs> hosted by blokes <laughs> named andrew and michael you know so he, he bankrolled this concert sold it to pbs in america who used it for their pledge drives and it just took off and was you know replayed endlessly well that's actually got a quite a good rugby league synergy because he's sort of pulled himself up by his bootstraps yeah uh he's a, he's a period didn't have a good rugby league synergy though. No. <laughs> he looked like a magician. Well, someone who did have a, a vaguely rugby league appearance was John Tesh, then <laughs> Entertainment Tonight host, who actually was briefly in Yanni's orchestra in the late 80s well. and went on to follow in his footsteps and launch his own new age career, uh, achieving not Yanni level success, but similarly, you know, booking out concerts and becoming a PBS star. Is there a more Australian piece of humor than the, uh, the full frontal sketch? I am John. So chin, chin. <laughs> <laughs> just make fun of the bloke's chin and we loved it <laughs> ate it up so uh v- very interesting story yanni yeah I-, I actually enjoyed learning more about him you know what after this discussion i'm actually I'm giving this promo the thumbs up for the arrow <laughs> <laughs> it just missed the mark with rugby league people that's yeah all. yeah but you gotta you got admire some sort of attempt to get out of the chook raffle yeah yeah so yeah I'll, I'll give them a pass too uh so that's what we're talking about here is buzz and the buzz of the season and at this point in time that buzz was entirely unconnected to Super League and it was being driven by these new clubs and it led to a bit of cockiness from John Quayle that wasn't really a good look in light of everything that was happening behind the scenes so he came out in the annual report and said the new season's going to be very exciting because of this it's disappointing while we're on the verge of something special that certain people within the game say too many teams not enough talent that means not enough money for us those people are the selfish ones who only consider themselves (laughs) like you had a win at the meeting but after every thing that's happened over the last couple of years before that it wasn't comprehensive the victory yeah yeah it was like last minute saved by someone with a lot of power yeah 
So I think there was an obligation to not only be conciliatory, but to actually listen to some of the recommendations and actually put into place the stuff you were talking about. They were given a golden opportunity to make some inroads in that respect and they didn't take it. And that goes through to how they were framing the 20 team competition and responding to criticism that it was too many teams and you can't keep expanding without retracting. I couldn't be told in 95 there was too many teams. I'm like, how good is this? Yeah, yeah. I was the same, but I mean, looking at it in any way rationally, like it is sheer lunacy that they went to 20 teams. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about going to 12. And, go. <laughs> and the, the buzz line then and since from Arthurson and Quayle was, we're giving it two years to settle in. A game with the future. Like, what does that even mean? And then in the aftermath, Arthurson would, would come out and say, you know, it was never given a chance. And it's like, well, because everyone knew, everyone could see. You already had your new clubs failing within the space of that two years. Well, I kind of had the idea that they go to these expansion areas and then consolidate Sydney clubs in the you know, medium term. That was the broad thinking I was yeah. thinking. And I suppose that's what they were thinking as well. That's what they were thinking, but it just doesn't make any sense to do it that way. And when you have Quail actively backing away from... The, the statements he made in the wake of the February meeting, it, it really spells trouble. So this was also in the annual report. The idea here is to shore up the game. You hear the clubs talking amalgamation, and if that's to be done mutually, to the benefit of everyone within those organisations, and for the long-term benefit of the game, we'll encourage that. But we haven't said we'll demand it. Well, how are you going to get <laughs> it down if, if you're not going to demand it? Everything is just like the, in, in the ether. Not only that, but also potentially setting the cat among the pigeons by issuing vague you know not threats but warnings to the club so john quayle also said if they're smart enough and active enough they'll survive if not they won't bad leadership yeah, uh, it's objectively bad leadership. Yeah, and for someone who was so capable and who did so much, I don't know if it's a blind spot or just or, or what it is, but it, it was a real failing of the administration. It's more um, arrogance. Yeah, yeah, in my view, and, and that's something that would follow Quail, as we'll hear about over the next few episodes. But funnily enough, this was an interesting quote later in the the campaign. So this was Ken Arthurson in the nineteen ninety seven annual report. So obviously, a, a lot of water had gone under the bridge to get to that point. But he, he says in 1997, it was also clear that the Sydney clubs who had given birth to the New South Wales Rugby League were reviving the heart of Rugby League. Six of the last eight teams in 1996 had come from Sydney. Rugby League shouldn't be confined to Sydney, but 1996 showed just as clearly that Sydney's large audience and the following Sydney clubs have in areas like rural New South Wales should never be underestimated. I can't express enough my belief that there should be one competition in Rugby League, but if the price of that competition is to sell names like St George, Parramatta, North Sydney, Manly, Sydney City, Bal Main and South into oblivion, then it's too high. And I guess at that stage, the PR war had taken hold and it was in the ARL's interest to, you know, defend those clubs because that's all they had left. You don't want to sell the name Sydney City out. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. That proud two-year tradition. <laughs> and the, the last thing before we move on from this idea is just a, a bizarre framing of the argument from John Quayle. Uh, so he said, the people who are seeking more pronounced changes are the people who want to eliminate those that allow them into the game. But the only change they want is to the Sydney metropolitan area. They're not conceding their own area. They're conceding the much metropolitan area because they consider that there are too many teams. It's like, yes, that's that's the argument. That's the exact argument. What Canberra's going to go, you know what? You know, I don't think we need it here in this uh, giant city with our one team. That's really, really dumb. And, and yeah, so obviously all this would come back to haunt the ARL. But I wanted to just spend a bit of time talking about those new clubs. Uh, the one we're going to spend the most time talking about is the Crushers, which was basically a disaster from the start. There were merger talks with the Gold Coast before they even <laughs> played their first game. <laughs> I mean, what, what an omen. And also before playing your first game, even the crushers were clinging to the beacon that that loyalty agreement provided. So this was Daryl Vanderveld. We're committed to the ARL. We've signed a five-year loyalty agreement. And as far as we're concerned, that's our priority at this point in time. But there's only one certainly in life, and that is death. We don't know what the future holds. The one thing we can guarantee is that, what, that whatever the scenario, we'll be involved in the national competition at the highest
highest level. This doesn't sound very promising. No. And they had, you know, a, a decent season in 1995. They, they did and they were in a hiding to nothing. It'd be like saying to a, a new uh, basketball team, all right, so Michael Jordan's with the Bulls. Um, you're going to be the second Chicago team. Yeah. Have at it. Yeah. So they ended up finishing 16, had an average crowd of over 20,000. So That's great. It's, it's great. But in June of 1995, they were projecting a $2 million loss for the year. They'd already asked the ARL for a loan. Well, that was one of about 15 clubs. So. Yeah. And uh, Daryl Vanderveld at this point said, we're certainly vulnerable at the moment and have to face the fact that we may have to close our doors. <laughs> Jesus. But I just I feel so bad for them. It's like, they go, all right, you've got the entire North Queensland Cowboys. You've got Western Australia Reds. You've got New Zealand mm. Warriors. Oh, by the way, here's a terrible slice of Brisbane that you're yeah. never going to be succeeding. It's so sad, that comment. I know. And yeah, obviously they are the second Brisbane team and were on a hiding to nothing. And that didn't help with Brisbane's attitude towards them. From the moment it was mooted that a second Brisbane team might come in, Brisbane kicked up the biggest stink. John Rebo at every management meeting was up in arms about it. But would you want your executives to look out for your club or the, your competitor? Yeah, exactly. So Brisbane were doing what was in their interests, but were, were very obnoxious about it in typical Broncos style. <laughs> so uh, Porky Morgan came out and said, it's been proved that two teams in South East Queensland didn't work. It was obvious all they were trying to do was root the Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> that may be the leader in the most rugby league quote in this series. Uh, and you could see history repeating with how badly they'd treated the Gold Coast from the start. The same thing was going to happen with a second Brisbane team one way or the other. And that's where I find this John Rebo quote particularly galling. He said, I couldn't see how it was going to help the league. The problem was with the number of clubs in Sydney. They didn't need another club in Queensland. They needed less clubs in Sydney. John Quayle said that it wouldn't affect us, but it wasn't us I was worried about. The club which would suffer the most was the Gold Coast. They should have been putting money into experience expanding the game there not diluting an already strong area like the height of you to express this you know phony paternalism about the plight <laughs> of the gold coast <laughs> who you'd done nothing but undermine for, you know, the last seven years. It makes sense if it come from somebody else, that quote. Yeah, but even if rooting the Broncos <laughs> wasn't the main <laughs> reason that the league wanted a second team there, you could see, like, there was... Uh, they were taking delight in the Broncos being upset about it all. Like, John Quayle came out and said that the Broncos have promoted the them and us thing well, but their monopoly on the city is over. Their monopoly on their state is over because there's three teams in Queensland now, not one. I'll defend this organisation as strongly as I possibly can because in many cases my agenda is different to Brisbane's. I have to look after all members, not just one. I don't have to do what one member tells me. Gee whiz. What should have happened is they all resigned their posts yeah. at 95. Yeah. <laughs> we had a fresh blood, old bad blood gone. How could they possibly work together? Yeah, yeah. It, it was over by that point. I think the crushers were always going to struggle. The one that we think about now as a no-brainer is the Reds. A, a team in Perth, we've discussed it many times as being essential and something that would there's little doubt that it would succeed and I still believe that but it needs to be done in the right way this time we can't have another half-assed attempt yeah no, I suggest no awful looking jerseys and awful sponsors <laughs> <laughs> well I guess with the sponsors you take what you can get these days <laughs> I don't want to see cash converters <laughs> but so on the field the, the Reds had a great start winning their opening round game the third team in league history to win their first game not counting the 1908 team of course a crowd of 24,000 for that first game hands down the most successful expansion club well I mean you can say that but the problem is they were doomed from the start because of their submission what got them into the league was eventually what killed them so at that point when they were the Perth Pumas in 1992 <laughs> uh, their director Ralph McManus was interviewed by the Sunday Mail and said the bonus of our submission is that one of our major sponsors would assist greatly with home and away travel expenses that was an area in which we initially looked at asking for some concessions but that that is no longer a concern. So they gave this promise that they would take care of expenses, you know, thinking that the money would always be there and that sponsor was going to stick around long term. <laughs> God almighty. Was it a handshake? <laughs> yeah. But from the league's perspective, if the only way you can force it, if the only way you can see a Perth team entering is if someone else is footing the travel bills, well, you're not ready to expand into Perth. Not diligent. So by the time Super League came around, they were hemorrhaging money uh, and, and basically had little choice but to accept the Super League deal because that was going to take these travel costs that was going to alleviate these travel costs I haven't gone into the <laughs> reports of the Western Reds in depth but I mean they had better crowds than most New South Wales 
clubs. I mean, how much can plane tickets and hotel rooms cost for half the season's games? Yeah, well, the, the issue is those crowds didn't stick around. If they'd held up in 1996 into 1997, it might have been a different story, but they, you know, basically cratered after a pretty decent first season. Uh, they cratered on field and with the crowds, plus losing all this money. Yeah. So in the end, it was, it was something of a one-season wonder, despite the fact that they had a team that was built for current and future success like we spoke about it in our first episode the squad they'd built and the juniors they had coming through like there's you know every chance that with a bit of backing and you know keeping the recruits coming on-field success could have been achieved reasonably quickly it's a crying shame at one stage they focused on quantity over quality in terms of getting people to come across especially juniors and then so they lured all these kids you know across the country and then halfway through the year like cut a lot of them loose with you know no nothing to fall back on leading to this big outcry from their parents who said they'd been you know dudded. they'd been dudded and that led to a back down from the management over that similar story the board of directors decided to overrule Peter Mulholland's first grade selections and pick the team themselves insane and then back down on that when that caused a media stir Peter Mulholland a great rugby league man mm. met him personally very fine gentleman and so in the end they needed everything to go their way and they just couldn't sustain it now, I, I think on field success in 1996 would have gone a long way to turning their fortunes around but it was just it was never going to work with the structure they had in place God, it's a shame. But we see now with the major events taken to Perth, there's definitely a chance that we can get it happening in yeah, the future. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think with better planning, learning from mistakes, and crucially, retracting before expanding again, because you, you can't go into an expansion team with a diluted player pool no. the way it is now. I think you need it to be like every team, you know, having a, a great squad. Like a Super League. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 These issues of, of planning and, and long-term thinking is really evident when you think about the Cowboys and, and this statement from Ken Arthurson in particular about their admission into the league. So, of course, we spoke about originally there was just going to be one team coming and then two, and then they decided to go to four. And Ken Arthurson said, despite the Cowboys having the weakest case for admission in terms of what they offered, he said, when you think of all the hard work done by Kerry Bostead, fair dinkum, it's hard to knock them back. <laughs> <laughs> He's that up there with Raper's blood and <laughs> Kerry Bose says working hard. Just... <laughs> so Kerry Bose said was their uh, inaugural chief executive and it seems like he was being undermined from the start. So he was staunch against Super League and ended up resigning his post when they signed. But it was a bad sign when they were at a meeting and anytime Kerry Bose had opened his mouth, the Cowboys chairman, Ron McLean, told him to shut up. Oh my God. <laughs> I described that as a very bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> and as for the Warriors, they were among the most uh, staunch anti-Super League clubs originally. How odd would it have been if the ARL had Auckland Warriors yeah. and like Norths and West? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, e even though they lost the game, dream start for the Warriors that first night. Yeah. Like, I just remember thinking that was the coolest thing Me I'd too. seen. You know. Still love the Warriors. Yeah. We're War still dealing with the myopic fans. Well, what are they even doing in the comp? Yeah. Um, no one in 1995 that first game against Brisbane knew that it would set the template for the next 25 years <laughs> having a 12 point lead you know late in the game and losing 25 22 everyone went it was going to take them about six months to a year to get used to first grade <laughs> intensity and after that they'll be sweet <laughs> wrong so with with those three new clubs jumping ship you had a lot of talk about the idea of loyalty and gratitude coming up against the reality of survival and I, I think it speaks of the naivety or the disingenuous nature of the ARL PR campaign to spend the 80s making the game more business oriented, focusing on commercial growth, sustainability, and then act shocked when their partners act with that same business mindset. And do you think that is the definitive answer as to whether these blokes are interested in finance? <laughs> like, I don't know how you can credibly expect clubs to act out of loyalty when presented with these two options. And in the way the ARL talk about that, you, you see like John Quayle saying, one of my main regrets is that we did not charge the new clubs a franchise fee for joining. Where's the loyalty the new clubs showed to the foundation clubs which voted them in? It's just the 
sentiment's nice, to, you know, the community gain, gain for the people, all that business, but it's just not realistic. No. What are you supposed to do? Like, try and run the tightest ship you can, but also prop up your competitors. It's, mm. like, bizarre. Yeah. So, with the new clubs in place and with the drama of Super League supposedly put behind them, the ARL had something to celebrate. And so, the new clubs became the focus of the opening weekend. And this was highlighted with a, a roadshow for the ARL and, you know, 70 esteemed journalists and ex-players who were taken on chartered flights uh, to Auckland on Friday night through to Brisbane, Townsville, and then Perth on the Sunday, uh, taking in the first games of all the new clubs. Very cool. And this, unlike the Tui's Challenge, this was a logistical triumph with, you know, <laughs> very tight deadlines to make it from one game to the next. And the unanimous sentiment on board the plane was that it was a great weekend. Um, Johnny Raper was on the plane. He said it was the best trip he'd ever been on. You reckon there was a couple of cans being yeah. cracked? Or? Well, not, not cans, actually. It was more fancy than that. Uh, this was a Johnny Raper quote. I feel like Kerry Packer, he said, tossing up between Chardonnay and Claret to compliment the lobster tail entree. Isn't this just great? <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's something really sweet about that and I'm, I'm glad like the old players were, were being looked after there yeah very sweet but wait, wait do you ever hear the word claret outside of rugby league no <laughs> I've never seen it for sale well uh, you see it in cask form right yeah the old Stanley claret okay yeah you're right and even the TV coverage was getting into the spirit of you know the new exciting frontier for rugby league so th this was how the rugby league week told the story about this new era heading the media coverage is the nine network who will telecast four winfield cup matches including the debut performance of three of the four new teams the nine coverage kicks off with friday night football at 8 30 p.m when the auckland warriors make their winfield cup debut from auckland nine's coverage travels to townsville with live coverage of north queensland clash with the bulldog at 8 30 on saturday the action continues on sunday with delayed coverage of matches that we played on opposite sides of the continent. At 6.30, Nine will teleclass the clash between South and Manly. Then at 10.45, the Western Reds debut against St. George will be beamed back from Perth. So 6.30, you get a, a full hour uh, of, of that game. Well, 42 minutes with ads before 60 minutes comes on. <laughs> then 10.45. <laughs> what a triumph. We just put up with absolute yeah. despicable coverage, didn't we? And in, in, that, in that same article with a straight face, David Page called it Nine Saturation Coverage. <laughs> For some reason, Channel Nine was viewed as this like major partner in the success of the game, and always looks after the game, and we, we couldn't possibly get the rights to anybody else. Mm. We just had to work around their stupid TV shows yeah. all the time. And another song we talked about the character of Kerry Packer last week. I don't have the quote with me, but there was another someone called him on it and said, "Why aren't you showing more sport live?" And and he said, well, "We have a responsibility to have balanced coverage. What? So only people who like sport get to watch TV?" Again, I probably didn't do the exact quote justice, but it, in spirit, that's yeah. But also, Burke's Backyard is taped. <laughs> this is a live event. So the, the opening weekend told a story with large crowds outside of Sydney and the four new clubs actually drawing 110,000 over the four games, but very small crowds in Sydney. So Balmain, who were having their first game as the Sydney Tigers playing at Parramatta Stadium, uh, they wanted to get into the spirit of the excitement. They, you know, had fireworks, a mini Olympics, slides and rides, a, a you know, cheer squad uh, for an enthusiastic crowd of 7,800. <laughs> At least they're enthusiastic. <laughs> but for John Quayle, this weekend was viewed as his own personal grand final. And he was seriously considering stepping away at this point, thinking that his job was done. I don't blame the bloke at that point. That long fight, it would have felt like a holiday. And that's why my heart like genuinely breaks for him that they couldn't even get through the weekend without Super League resurfacing. <laughs> so on the flight from Brisbane to Townsville on Saturday, Sun Herald sports editor Ian McKinnon came up to Quayle and said, John, I just want to warn you, by the time we get to Townsville, the Sydney papers will be out. We have a story saying Super League's going ahead. I'm sorry. Quayle, and then this is in uh, Mike Coleman's Super League book. You can just feel the tiredness and, and resignation in John Quayle's you know, body. Uh, as Mike Coleman says, Quayle shut his eyes and he exhaled loudly. That again, he said, geez, couldn't they have waited till after the weekend? Oh, God. Mm. And in his own words, he said, it was supposed to be the best weekend of our lives. Everything we'd worked for came to fruition that weekend. We were supposed to sit back and enjoy it. Well, it didn't happen. Unbelievable. So very shrewd tactics by News Limited to do it on that opening weekend. Take the gloss off it. Make sure that the back pages are talking about Super League, not, you know, the, the triumph of what the league had achieved. Also shrewd to do it 
through the Sun Herald, not the Telegraph, to distance themselves from it. It is actually, yeah. And there was a view that one of the reasons that News was trying to do that was to destabilise the league to make it even more hard for them to attract a sponsor that would be able to come up to what Winfield was offering. But as much as like, I, I know you're an anxious person. I read that quail quote and I just like, <laughs> I, I just shivered. I'm like, oh my God, can you imagine? But the reality is it, it was only ever going to be a distraction from the issues. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you would have liked the Sunday to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so from this point on, there was no more retreating into the shadows. So all the whispers were now out in the open and Ian Heads in the Rugby League Week described it as the now permanent shadow that Super League cast over the league. So everything for the next month was framed around Super League and there was going to be no ignoring it. Was there a more evocative writer in Rugby League than Ian Heads? Mm, yeah, he is brilliant in this period in particular writing for the rugby league week him and tasker are just this like as a duo mm. not that they wrote together but just yeah. seeing both of them in in that magazine the daily and stewart yeah and so the arl had a number of responses to this one was to get heavy-handed with threats suggesting that anyone found to be dealing with news limited or trying to rebel against the league would be expelled uh, they had threatened that earlier but this time it was coming out more and more that clubs were facing expulsion and i remember that because i was terrified that like you know camera were going to get kicked out you know but what about like <laughs> prohibition's never worked in rugby league for anything ever yeah salary cap whatever yeah yeah <laughs> so and and the other plan they had was to actually meet news by coming up with a, a two-tier plan which they were proposing to run as early as 1996 so it was devised by john singleton so it became known as the singleton plan again, again. <laughs> why is he involved um he was, was at his peak of his like yeah. ad man uh, reputation then. Mm. I suppose. So basically, just just to run down how the system would have worked. So the twenty teams would remain as is. The what was being run as the ch challenge cup would effectively be a competition to see whether you would be in the top tier or the bottom tier. So teams would be seeded, play off against each other for six weeks. You get your top ten and your bottom ten. From there, you'd have an 18-round regular season with the 10 top teams who would effectively be the Super League uh, playing off and the bottom teams playing against each other. So two full rounds in each tier. I've already had an Evelyn fit. Yeah. I mean, we saw this with the English game. This mumbo-jumbo does not work. All, all people want is a amount of teams to play each other once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they want. Exactly. I'm, I'm glad you said that because I, I had the same thing reading it. It was very hard to even like get through trying to put that in an order to read it out. And my my note was there's a worry it's too convoluted big worry like you want it to be easy to explain you want to be able to sell that in one line how your competition works that's what the nfl's got going for it 16 games um everyone plays each other once in their conference mm. yeah. yeah beautiful so that was the league but a even though I, I don't love it as a system it was the league at least acknowledging that they were taking the threat seriously and you know they were looking towards the future in the hope that it would stave off news or give them the chance to come through the front door again and have a piece of this you know new era that the league was starting but of course that wasn't going to be enough for news who had their own plans in motion uh so through february and into march they were working on their next step uh and the point where it got really serious is when john rebo confided in wayne bennett about what news was planning and he actually did that on that first opening weekend so in auckland he went for a jog with wayne bennett and and you know filled him in on the details and the way wayne bennett tells it the Broncos were in Auckland for the first round of the competition when John Rebo came up to me explaining, I've got something pretty important to tell you. We went for a jog together and I love the words I heard. Normally I run away from John Rebo when we jog, but that time in Auckland I raced to keep by his side and uh, John Rebo went to say that he told him the whole story and said that Wayne had always been you know, a, a conscience for him. So when Wayne Bennett was enthusiastic and got behind it, it gave him extra confidence that they, they were on the right path. Well, we've seen some of Wayne Bennett's conscious decisions in the last 20 years since this. Yeah. I mean, is he the guy? <laughs> <laughs> but so I don't know the level of detail that Rebo gave to Bennett in terms of the logistics, but what news had planned was much of, of what we saw play out. The interesting thing from looking at the scheming was the clubs that they decided to approach. So they were drawing up like pros and cons for each of them. So for instance, Manly were viewed as a strong potential Super League target because they had Kerry Packers supports, they had some money, they had sponsorship through Pepsi. Uh, the perceived weaknesses were Ken Arthurson's influence and the need for ground renovation. <laughs> 
<laughs> but that would have been the absolute dagger. Like, can you imagine? Oh, it, like, I'm so happy he's lived so long after yeah. this, but I don't know if that would have ended him. That would have ended him then and there. Explain to me how Kerry Packer's involved with East Sandman. I don't, still don't get So he became friends with Bob Fulton when, um, I think when Fulton went to East in the 70s mm. and when, and you know, became really good friends with him. So when Fulton went back to coach Manly, Kerry Packer like was looking after Manly and the story goes that he was originally a South man. Yeah, so he's giving money to both clubs. Yeah. Wow. And you can see, uh, and the insight you get into the Super League planning is, is quite revealing. Well, not really revealing because we know much of it. So Newcastle, for example, the strength was obviously, the, you know, the, the one club thing, a very strong support base. One of the weaknesses they cited was its ground. And I only went to McDonald Jones, whatever it is now recently, and I thought it was one of the best rugby yeah, league grounds I've been is. to. Yeah, so can you tell me Marathon in the 90s? Uh, it was fun, but it was it was, uh, it was just three hills and you know, a sort of 80s grandstand. Mm. Quite big, but still 80s. Yeah. So it wasn't up to snuff. Yeah. Uh, you could fit 34,000 in if you're breaking fire regulations. <laughs> <laughs> it was a ground of its time, the International Sports Centre, like yeah. slash marathon. Mm. But now it's really cool. Yeah, I love it. The other weakness of Newcastle was the large debts they were encumbered with, uh, and Rebo felt that they would poorly run. It should be a private enterprise. And quite a number of Sydney clubs just didn't even merit the the pro and con discussion they just were never on the super league's radar so north south west and balmain were never considered i would have thought balmain would have got a list to look in well it's funny at that point super league were all about you know excluding as many clubs as they could so there was no no place for illawarra as a standalone club there was definitely no place for the crushers when they didn't get the clubs to fall in line as they thought that they would as soon as the money was on the table they then had to go out and go after every club that they could which is a big part of, of the latter stages of this first season of our series Fun, and so at this point it was underway so John Rebo with Paul Morgan with Ken Cowley were working on the plan of attack that is going to dominate our next chapter but it's so funny that the way it was positioned in the media even at this point was you know Murdoch versus Packer but it wasn't really until this point of the story that Rupert Murdoch actually takes any kind of role up until this point it had all been Ken Cowley from the News Limited side filling Rupert Murdoch in, but with Murdoch not really showing any interest in it. It's amazing how easy it was to shape a narrative pre-internet. Mm. You could do it quite easily. Yeah, yeah. So at this point, Murdoch does get involved though, and this was on the 23rd of March. So think about that. It's like literally a week before that everything happens and Murdoch's only being like filled in on the details <laughs> and giving his final approval then. I've read so many books on Packer and Murdoch and Channel 9 and blah, blah, blah. They all, these guys, these titans of business just seem to make these snaps decisions all the time and just yeah. off the cuff mm. decisions that can impact you know hundreds of millions of dollars it's incredible so as i said here a week before super league starts murdoch enters the story and this is when john rebo arrives at news limited sydney offices to pitch both super league as a concept and the plan of attack that they'd put together which interestingly enough in the rugby league week on the 29th of march so only a couple of days out and only a couple of days after that meeting uh sherlock not living up to his name said yes it's true that john rebo was seen striding briskly into the sydney offices of news limited during the week no there's nothing sinister in that news have an important ongoing sponsorship deal with the broncos and rebo as chief executive services that arrangement on a regular basis as he should and he as he does all others so they they somehow managed to keep that under wraps so as he did stride in to that office he had a meeting for 11 30 uh was told that it, there'd be a short wait it was about three o'clock by the time he finally got in uh and at that point he'd never met rupert murdoch so you'd imagine this would be a pretty intimidating prospect going in and suggesting a complete shake-up of the game that you love which Murdoch wouldn't have cared about, but doing that to one of the richest and most powerful men in the world. Yeah. Take some balls. By all accounts, it's quite charming in person. Mm. So Rebo went through the plan. Murdoch was, uh, you know, inquisitive. He was asking questions throughout it, but didn't really give any, you know, outward enthusiasm until the end when he said, I like the sounds of this. Good luck with it. And that was basically it. <laughs> all, all this, this, you know, the culmination of this year long battle that would end up, you know, completely changing the fact fabric of the game and causing so much heartache and it was just signed off on with you know one line yeah oh my god uh but as john rebo walked out of the room rupert murdoch stopped him and said don't think this is going to be easy kerry's going to go ballistic <laughs> 
So that's it for this chapter. Next week, uh, it's really on. It will be the first of many episodes on April Fool's Day. So there's a a whole lot to discuss there. In the meantime, please let us know know your thoughts on this episode through the Rugby League Digest at gmail.com. Hit us up on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Make sure you give us a review on Apple Podcasts if you can. Uh, And we're we're now up on all major platforms, aren't we? Specify a positive review. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, actually, I got a four-star review the other day. I'm like, that doesn't help us at all. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, we're on Spotify now. We're on YouTube. Everything's on YouTube for the oldies. Uh, okay, so with that, we'll speak to you next week. Toodaloo. Toodaloo.